Candice, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. There is a lot to talk about. <laughs> I want to first <laughs> go back to the beginning and we'll take the story from there. Starting Sprinkles, I know about your story, but for people who aren't familiar, how did you start Sprinkles in the first place, Candice? So I started my career in a more sort of traditional career path. I was recruited out of school to work at an investment bank in corporate finance. It was the height of the dot-com boom in the late 90s. And then, of course, there was the dot-com bust. (laughs) <laughs> and I was out of a job and wondering what I was going to do with myself. And then 9-11 happened and really gave me a moment to do some reflection on what I wanted to do with my life yet again on a deeper <laughs> level. And I realized I didn't love what I had been doing, which was crunching numbers. And I wanted to do something that I was more passionate about. So instead of going to business school, I went to pastry school, which was a really serious left turn for me because... You know, I was raised in a family that really believed in traditional education. My dad was a lawyer. Um, You know, they wanted me to obviously do whatever made me happy, but that pastry school had never really been part of the plan. (laughs) And and, all my friends were kind of scratching their heads at what they kind of figured it was a phase and I'd come back to my senses. But when I got to pastry school, I realized I really loved it. I loved just, you know, how tangible it was creating something with my hands that I could give to someone and watch them enjoy. Like that was very rewarding for me. And um, so it grew from there. I realized that the cupcake at the time was very basic and more sort of a sort of commodity. You know, you'd see them in the grocery stores. They were packed in plastic clamshells and they were a kid's treat and and nostalgic and everybody in our country loves a cupcake, but Ooh, yes. we we didn't really like them beyond that nostalgia, right? Because they were just, they weren't that tasty. They were just kind of meant for a kid's lunchbox. So I thought that the cupcake's time had come and it was time for a reinvention. <laughs> and I wanted to take this sort of lowly kid's treat and make it um, elevated and giftable and aspirational And in doing so, I wanted to sort of set the cupcake on a pedestal and devote a bakery just to the cupcake. (laughs) There is so much to unpack. One thing I want to go back to, because I don't feel like I've heard this in other podcasts. When you decided to go to pastry school, what were the alternatives you were considering? Was there anything else you were thinking about and doing? Obviously, you said the MBA, it was uh, people that force on you. But like, were there other businesses you wanted to start, other things you thought about doing, other careers? I'm just curious. And if there was at that time, anything else? No, I, I was a very, I, I, I never imagined that I would be an entrepreneur. I grew up in this very risk averse household. And so entrepreneurship was not a path I thought would ever, you know, be for me. Like I never thought I would take that path. And so in, in sort of making that first step, that first courageous step off of my sort of predicted path, Um, And going to pastry school, I think that is where I sort of built the confidence and the courage to think about entrepreneurship as as a viable option. How did you deal with the the pushback? Because you said that wasn't like your kind of maybe life path by others. And they're like questioning you like, is Candace okay? Like, how did you deal with that pushback at the time? I think I felt pretty strongly about what I was doing. I had this unique insight of you know, what I thought the world could use, which was, you know, an upscale cupcake. And I think Mm -hmm. I just recognized that other people didn't have that unique set of experiences or perspective to allow them to see the vision that I saw for the world. With that too. So knowing that like at the time with these cupcakes, like they're very basic. Everyone kind of knew that too. And we saw that everyone has like relates perfectly to that picture you put already put in our minds. Did you like, what kind of research did you do at that time? You're like, okay, well, in this area, I know if Cupcake says this, did you like also talk to other people, research here? Like, I'm just curious at that time, because like looking back, it always seems so obvious. Like, oh yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing there. And like sprinkles made sense. Of course, Candace started it. But at the time, like, what did you do to research that to figure out if this is like, you were just in a microcosm or if there's like, really this is a whole thing where there's an opportunity here. I'm just curious on that standpoint. So a couple things. One, I had just recently gotten married and when I was getting married, I was, so obsessed with Martha Stewart Weddings Magazine. (laughs) So I was, you know, doing all this research for my wedding. I was going around town and doing the wedding cake tastings, which of course was my favorite part. But I also (laughs) happened to notice, you know, through Martha Stewart Weddings and also all of these wedding cake makers I was, I was meeting with, 
there was a new trend on the scene and it was the cupcake tower, the upscale mm. cupcake tower. And this was sort of a new trendy alternative to the traditional wedding cake. And so that kind of put that idea in my mind that cupcakes can be upscale. They can be fancy, right? For lack of a better word. Um, I, of course, opted for the traditional wedding cake because I had to have that. <laughs> but it definitely wormed its way into my subconscious. And then also just looking back to sort of birthday parties when I was at the office, you know, someone would always be somebody's birthday and someone would go out and get a cake. And then there'd be this, you know, search for like, where's some forks? Where's a, where's a knife that can cut this cake? And then of course, you know, we'd get carrot and somebody didn't like carrot or they couldn't eat walnuts or whatever. It was a total mess. And then somebody had to clean up. There's just so much to love about a cupcake. Everybody can have their own flavor. There's no fork and knife involved. It's personalized. It's portable. I mean, there's so much to love. And also, just to backtrack a little bit, I grew up overseas a lot of my life. I was an, an expat living in Southeast Asia. And so I, I had tended to have an obsession, sort of almost like an outsider foreigner's obsession with American things, mm. um, treats especially. And cupcakes are very uniquely American. And um, so I, I had a, a special love for cupcakes. And I also knew that in reinventing the cupcake, it wasn't like bringing some, you know, cult, new cultural trend from some other country. It's like, this is ingrained in our culture. We celebrate birthdays as kids with cupcakes. So in elevating something that people already loved, I knew there was a built-in market. With this at that time, so you knew already like this is going to be a thing. You have it in your mind, like I'm doing this. There's no other option anyways. We're going for it. Take me through the early days of like, getting this started. Like there's so many aspects of this I want to go into, but first I want to think about like, how did you make your first sales, create the first product of what this was going to be? Because I talked to a lot of founders and like these early days, like to me are the most exciting to talk about. Cause I'm like, how do you get off the ground though? Cause like people can talk about scaling later on. It's like, it's like a pipe dream for many people. I never get to that level. Like, how do I get started? How did you get started tangibly on like the product itself, like having great cupcakes, getting in the hands of people in the early days? I'm curious about that. So I had this idea for an upscale cupcake, cupcake that would be reinvented, a cupcake that would cost $3 as opposed to the 75 cents people were used to paying for Going them. crazy. Well. I love it. But I knew that if I were going to bet my life savings on bootstrapping this business, which really isn't a defensible business. If you think about it, like you work with a lot of technology companies, you think about IP, you think about what is the defensible moat here. There really is none when it comes to a cupcake bakery. Anyone can make a cupcake. Anyone can start a bakery. So I knew that I had to make a really exceptional product. That had to be sort of my first line of defense. Like this product has got to be good. And so I, I spent almost two years recipe developing my husband, I mean, much to the dismay of his family, had told me he would join me in this crazy venture if I could really nail the product. And so that was, for me, never having thought of myself as an entrepreneur, that was a really important first step is to have my co-founder who really believed in me and said, hey, I, I got you. Like, I, I will do this with you. And that was, that was super helpful from a confidence perspective. And then lit a fire under me to get this product, like, just really sort of a, a memorable tasting cupcake. And then of course, if I was reinventing the cupcake, I couldn't stop with just the ingredients and the technique. I had to create a whole brand from scratch that really spoke to the quality of the cupcake. And you know, you're right. I had to sort of test my idea a little bit before going all in because all signs pointed to this was a crazy idea. Not only had no one done it before, but it was the height of the low carb diet craze. Mm. And here I was trying to sort of erect this temple to carbs. So I just started, you know, by, you know, working out of my home kitchen in West Hollywood yes. and, you know, first started by showing up at every party with these cupcakes and people were like, who's the girl with the cupcakes? Like she's just <laughs> a cupcake pusher. She's so annoying. I would show up at trunk shows. Then I started seeding my product, product seeding. I didn't call it that at the time, but product seeding around town, you know, showing up at concierges at hotels, showing up at, you know, fancy salons and and it was me. It was the founder with the cupcakes telling my story, like very boots on the ground, very do things that don't scale. And that's what I did. And I started to, to develop this loyal but devoted following just out of my West Hollywood apartment. I had the producer of the Tyra Banks show call me. I had no idea how she found my number. <laughs> and she was like, I want your cupcakes for Tyra's 30th birthday. So I knew I was on to something. 
Yeah. And that was just the sort of traction that I needed to start to look for a retail location and really take this quite seriously. Okay. There's two things in that that I have to cover. One with the distribution side of it, people finding you, you said like the Tower Bank show, like didn't know how they found you. Were other people, like I'm assuming it spread through word of mouth, but then were people like, Hey, here's Candace's number. Call her. Here's her email. Like, like, what was that? Like, what did you have a website? Like, I'm just trying to picture this. Like, how are they getting in touch with you to get these cupcakes? Like, like dealing cupcakes underground. I'm curious. Like, what? This that was so like. pre Instagram days. This was like, <laughs> I, mean. I would drop the cupcakes in their little bakery box with my business card taped to the top. Love so, it. this was old school, Love like it. landline ringing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the youths have no idea. (laughs) And so for sure, it was organic word of mouth, which of course is, you know, how you know you have product market fit to use a tech term, but it was, it was really important for me to see that my product was already speaking for itself. And then one other thing. So you said, I can't gloss over this because this was bothering me the whole time. Two years of product development, like Two, that's like non-trivial. People think about starting a business and like, yeah, let's like do this thing and like sell it tomorrow or next week. It's like two years of development. What, what did that entail? Are you testing cupcakes daily? Like, just tell me a little bit more about that process. I love that. It's fascinating. Sure. Well, and, and to be clear, it wasn't like I spent every day solely dedicated to recipe development over those two years. Those two years also included looking for a retail location, building the brand, but I was always tweaking. And really what it looked like was my husband and I seated at our dining room table with just like <laughs> platters of cupcakes strewn everywhere with little half bites taken out of each one. <laughs> and then I would take our notes, which we would you know, scribble onto notepads, and I would go back into the kitchen and start again. And meanwhile, this is like I was in my late 20s. We're in LA. All my friends are up on Sunset Boulevard drinking Cosmopolitans. <laughs> and I was in the kitchen, in my kitchen clogs, hunched over a KitchenAid mixer. It wasn't cool. It definitely <laughs> wasn't cool. And and I was, there were definitely periods of time where I was like, did I just throw away my career for uh, you know, Saturday <laughs> nights in the kitchen? I don't know. But um, but it, it was fun. And I think, you know, at the time there was a lot of uncertainty and doubt, of course, but sure. it makes for a great story now. <laughs> great to look back on for sure. No, no doubt about that. When you're in it, it's hard. <laughs> yes. When you're in it, it's a lot, a lot different situation. And you mentioned then find this retail location, which I've heard you talk about other podcasts. I don't want, I want to get into that in a second, but I'm curious before you start the re- retail location, like give us like an idea of where the business was at in terms of like demand and everything. Cause like, to me, that's always tricky when people talk about like, Oh, look at this and the found this. It's like, but like, where was the company at? Like when I talked to founders and they're like, we raised this money here, but like how much traction did you have? I'm curious, just like generally, like where was the business at by the time you like, okay, we need to find a retail location. I had sort of a brisk business um, that I was doing out of my West Hollywood apartment, but I mean, brisk given that I had one KitchenAid mixer and one employee, which was me. I mean, it was as much as I could handle, certainly. But it was also just, and that was all I needed to know that, uh, to have comfort with the risk I was about to take in terms of signing a lease. Mm. I really thought that if I could elevate this cupcake to a place where, sorry, elevate this cupcake to a place where, you know, people in the entertainment industry wanted to send it around as gifts, that in and of itself would be a good business because, I mean, I know you're LA based and I'm sure you have friends in the entertainment industry, but there's a real culture of gift giving. And I knew at the time there were a couple of cookie businesses that, you know, had the lion's share of that market. And I thought at a minimum, I've got birthday parties. (laughs) Everybody has a birthday every year. And if I can get some of that gift giving, I I should be okay. I'm not going to fall flat on my face. But it was a bootstrapped business. My husband and I pulled our resources from a few years, you know, in the career force, and we gave ourselves that amount of money and how, however much time that was to give this a go. And then finding a location. Uh, take us through that, that part of the process, Candace. Yeah, hard to do in a tight <laughs> real estate market, which it was at the time. And also, we, my husband and I were newcomers to Los Angeles. So we really studied the market as outsiders. We drove everywhere from Pasadena to Venice to try to figure out where would be the right place for this very special cupcake shop. And um, noticed a lot of things in sort of scouring the town, which was 
you know, a lot of people say people in LA don't eat carbs, but as we drove around, we saw a lot of donut shops, a lot of burger joints, as you know, they're like in every strip center. So I don't know why people say that. Um, LA definitely has more of a reputation for green juice and yoga, but that also gave me some comfort. But we did not have a lot of success finding a location right away because we had no experience. We had no track record. We are not the ideal um, you know, people to be leasing a space to. And then in addition to that, nobody really thought our idea was any good. All we ever heard was, what else are you going to sell? And I remember one <laughs> landlord hung up on me, you know, uh, cup, no, just cupcakes, just cupcakes. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of non-believers out there, a lot of non-believers. Did you, like, what did you want in a space? Because you're looking all over, you're looking, like I said, Vanessa Pasadena, like basically all over LA. For people who don't know, LA is very spread out. It's like multiple cities, it seems like in one. What did you want in a space at that time? Like, were there things you like particularly were looking for? Like, I know you, like, and, and f- tell us how you landed on the, uh, the Beverly Hills location. I think we were looking for a mix of foot traffic, which by the way, is hard to find in LA, as you know. I mean, LA is very much yeah. a driving culture. It's it's hard to find foot traffic unless you're at the Grove, which of course yeah. we couldn't afford. We couldn't afford that rent. We have since opened at the Grove, but at the time <laughs> we couldn't. And you know, just I we were we were really going a lot by just our gut. It's not like we were looking at numbers. I mean, we had a commercial broker who was helping us, but um, it just had to feel right. And ultimately, we landed on Beverly Hills. And people scratch their heads at this because they're like, wasn't that so expensive? How did you afford that? I mean, this was Rodeo Drive adjacent, adjacent. (laughs) This is a couple blocks away on a block of, you know, retail that was not known for being very fancy at all. (laughs) And we took over just a rundown sandwich shop and it was tiny, 600 square feet front and back. But it made sense to have that 90210 zip code for us because what we were doing is we were creating a really elevated, um, uh, elevated sort of, what would you say? Like artisanal product. And we were yeah. creating a boutique that almost felt more like a Rodeo dry boutique than it would, than it did a traditional bakery. So it all made sense as far as the product we were putting out was luxury. And so the space and the geography had to sort of reflect that. Okay. Continuing the story, you find the space, you get the space in Beverly Hills, Beverly Hills. And I want to know like opening day leading up to that and then like launching, having people actually be able like, just walk me through that part of the story. I want to hear more about that. Well, again, we were, you know, my husband and I, not to gloss over this, we had no experience in retail and restaurants. I mean, <laughs> I had gone to pastry school. I can make a good cupcake, but that was about it. We renovated this space. It was beautiful. And on day one, you know, I baked enough cupcakes to fill the cupcake case. I figured we'd be good at people would be coming in buying one or two at a time. And on day one, this email newsletter went out called Daily Candy. Some people might Mm, remember it, but it was sort of like one of the earliest email marketing newsletters. And it featured us for the day. And people showed up for that newsletter, man. I mean, people really followed it. (laughs) So we had a crowd from the moment we opened. And I was wrong. People were not buying one or two. They were buying one or two dozen. So within a few hours, we were completely sold out. My dream had become a nightmare because all of these customers who'd driven across town, found parking, and had waited in line for cupcakes were now being told to come back later. Um, uh, We're working as fast as we can. We're really sorry. So I spent like the first few months probably, you know, sweating it out, like (laughs) between baking furiously in the back, coming out front and apologizing to customers that we had no cupcakes. It was a disaster. Like our production was a disaster. We had no idea what we were doing. We did not have a team that knew what they were doing. We were hiring people just as they walked in, just out of desperation. So we were drinking from a fire hose from day one. And I think, you know, I don't ever recommend people (laughs) doing that. But what's interesting is that scarcity, particularly in a town in LA that's driven a little bit by FOMO, oh, it ended up driving <laughs> demand. And we became, we became known for that line out the door, which some people actually accuse me later of actually premeditating that. Oh, did you make the store really small so you'd always have a line out there? I'm like, no, I had no idea what I was doing. That was all I could afford. <laughs> But it did end up working in our favor. And we did end up eventually, you know, 
hiring some people, getting our production in order, um, and, you know, continue to be the beneficiary of a lot of great word of mouth and buzz. And that ultimately ended up coming from celebrities, not just, you know, your average everyday tastemaker. Did you have to, I mean, to that point, because like from very early on, you had buzz already. Did you have to do much marketing at all? Did you have to just feed some of the other stuff? Like, oh, we know, get this in the hands of these people. It might help. Like just same with that side of things. I'm always obsessed with growth. And I know some things when you have these like viral products like this, it's like, it definitely gives you bumps and maybe carry. I'm just curious on how they're early on the marketing, how you had, how do you have to like handle that with the sprinkles? Early on, we had no budget for marketing. We yeah. probably did not pay for PR or marketing for the the first couple of years. And then we knew as we started to expand, first we opened in Newport Beach, then we decided, you know, the cupcake industry exploded so rapidly. We went from being, you know, a terrible idea to <laughs> a natural idea. And all these cupcake mm-hmm. degrees started popping up everywhere. So we knew we had to sort of if we wanted to be a national brand and a cupcake leader, we had to expand outside of Southern California and prove the concept had legs outside of just this, you know, Southern California market. So we ended up going to Dallas. And at that point, I knew as we were entering a new market, we needed to really um, put some money behind PR and enter this market in the right way. But, you know, the celebrities really helped us just they organically, they loved sprinkles. They would wait in line for sprinkles. They would talk about sprinkles in their interviews. <laughs> Oprah Winfrey had us on her show. Um, later on, we started this initiative where we would partner with a celebrity who would choose a charity and, and we would co-develop a cupcake together. Like we did one with Blake Lively. And that of course generated a lot of buzz and obviously raised a lot of money for great cause. So we will learn to work really creatively too with um, our customer base and and our celebrities and, and had a lot of fun, but you know, that organic word of mouth, I think is so important. And particularly now as businesses are having trouble with customer acquisition, um, you know, you have to go back to, do you have a good product? Do you have something that people are telling their friends about? Um, But yeah, at a certain point in a business's, at a business's, you know, life cycle, you do need to add a little fuel to the fire there. With that too, one thing I want to unpack with the growth, because if you take a step back, so you have an idea for the sprinkles, you're like, okay, this is obviously you see the world a certain way. So I love about entrepreneurs. They like have this vision for it. You're like, this is gonna be a lot of work. I don't know if this is going to work or not. Obviously you take a jump, like a risk, you go into this and you do this. And then you do this first location, you find the first location, all the work that went into that. Again, you don't know what's going to happen. People show up and they keep showing up and they keep showing up. And you had this one location, but like going back to your vision, you knew this was going to be a thing, or at least you thought so. And then this kind of confirmed that. And then we just talked about the growth you went through. Take me through like after your first location did well and you're, at what, what point were you like, all right, our expansion plans are what? Like, do we want to go other cities outside of LA? Do we stay in Southern California? Like just take me through how you thought about growth at that time. Because again, a lot of times I talk to entrepreneurs, like there's a lot of ways they can expand. And it's up to them to decide that. So I'm just curious on how you and your husband were thinking about that after you had this like validated check, like first from West Hollywood in the in the kitchen to like this new actual location. How do you think about growth from the early days then after that? It's a great question. And it's funny because not to fast forward, but eight years in, I stepped away, we brought in a strategic partner. I stepped away operationally yep. from Sprinkles. And it's probably the one thing that my husband and I still talk about to this day, like to do the right thing, because we, we had no idea really how fast the market would explode and yeah. how quickly those cupcake bakeries would pop up. At the same time, we had a lot of interest in franchises. People were begging mm. us for franchises. They wanted to take the Sprinkles experience back home to their hometown. And I get it. And we were very focused on owning our channel from beginning to end. We were not going to wholesale. We had a lot of offers for that, obviously. We were not going to franchise. We were going to own this from beginning to end. And, you know, I do stand behind that because I think, you know, to my point about the cupcake having to be really memorable and exceptional, like the difference between a memorable cupcake and an average cupcake is it's very subtle. It's very nuanced. It's an extra minute in the oven. It's a sloppily frosted or boxed cupcake. It's a bad customer service experience. And so I couldn't, I mean, truly like recovering control freak here, couldn't hand off that experience 
to someone else. Now, in saying no to all those franchises, what happened was all those people went back to their hometowns and just started their own mom and pop. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right? And so what we ended up doing was as we saw how quickly the market was exploding, we decided we had to really stake our claim as the original Cupcake Bakery, as the leader um, in this in this world. And so we started expanding across the country to really, you know, become a national brand um, as opposed to just owning one geographic area, which would have been a lot simpler because <laughs> what we were doing was quite complex from, you know, in the food world, we were, you know, picking up, going to a totally different market, having to reintroduce ourselves to the market, train and hire an entirely new staff, train them in the sprinkles way, in our company culture. And then, you know, we were fully boots on the ground, baking and frosting everything on site. And then we'd pick up again and go to another town and do the same thing. So it was really hard. Um, but I think ultimately it worked for us because, you know, from New York to LA, we were probably, we probably had the, the best brand recognition. I mean, arguably I think we did. Um, but also for me, it was about, you know, how else could we stake our claim? We, we ended up rolling out, um, dry mixes through Williams Sonoma. So 250 stores across the United States had sprinkles branded mixes that did very well. Um, and then I also really leaned and stepped into my personal brand. I was, you know, the face on the uh, very hit show um, on the <laughs> network called Cupcake Wars. Yes. And every week, you know, I was in people's living rooms and the intro was, you know, the founder of Sprinkles, the original Cupcake Bakery. So that also helped us um, in terms of our brand recognition. But, but every now and again, we're like, should we have franchised? I don't know. <laughs> you never know. There's not necessarily a right answer. I'm very happy with how everything unfolded, but but there's always questions that linger. Uh, okay. Because we're going to have some fun with this. The franchise part, let's just say you would have gone down that path. What would you have wanted from that path for you to be happy with that decision of going the franchise route? You know, I think I always saw Sprinkles as a business that could exist in pretty much any town, any mid-sized yeah. town, um, small city in America. I really, really saw that. I think, you know, what was hard was when we would open in a city and people would come in and say, oh, you're just like such and such cupcake place down the street really got to me because <laughs> no. can't I know, no, no, they're just like us. <laughs> Um, but you can't expect customers to understand that difference. The onus is on you to to really lean into your brand and differentiate yourself from the competition and continue to innovate and to continue to, you know, um, uh, set that standard. So um, I think, you know, I would have loved to have seen sprinkles in every mall across America, like a Mrs. Yeah. Fields. Uh, yes. <sighs> Other founders who may be in a similar position who are thinking about franchising versus kind of owning the distribution, uh, going about their own way, owning all the stores, et cetera. Anything you would tell them about the decision? Any advice for them? You know, that's hard for me to say because I'm certainly not an expert in franchising. Sure. I would say that you have to weigh the how the you have to weigh the risk of the market outpacing the growth that you can handle on your own. Sure. Um, and, and sort of look at the pros and cons there because franchising is certainly, I mean, we could have very much capitalized on the cupcake fervor that was going on at the time and, and how much people wanted to open their own little bakeries. Yeah. So, um, again, not that I regret what we did. It's just yeah, always yeah. one of those fun little mind games we like to play. Well, well, it's like, even if you went the franchise route, then you think about the other route you could have gone. Like, it, it's not like you would have, yeah, you always think about the other the other side of it. And you just have to live with the decisions you make, which is the reality of it. Um, what I want to get into, you did this, you went that route, you kept expanding, you grew, you grew. You mentioned like eight years in, uh, you saw like significant state to private equity, I believe. Um, take me through the timing of that, why you ended up going that route then. Like, I know people always, there's a, always debate between selling and not selling and when to sell and all these things. Just curious about your perspective on that as well. Well, I think the best time to sell, which can be hard for a founder, is when things are going really well and someone will pay for the opportunities that you still mm. have ahead of you. We had just launched the Cupcake ATM, which- I was going to say that, yeah. Yeah, really <laughs> disrupted the industry again and established us as, as a clear leader. 
And the Cupcake ATM has really been amazing. You'll see them popping up everywhere now. They're really expanding through airports and, and college campuses. And I saw it at USC during my during business school. I remember that's seeing it. That's right. I was, like, what? I was like, what is that? What? That's amazing. Yes. That's awesome. <laughs> and then I think, you know, my husband and I really like that early stage, uh, founding stage of the company. It's creative. It's, you know, you, you know everybody's names. You're like, yep. everybody's in it together. It's just <laughs> zero this to one, yeah. feeling, zero to one, exactly. And we're less excited about just straight operations. And, sure. you know, having a national brick and mortar business, food business is no joke. It's really exhausting. It's physically grueling. And there wasn't a moment in the in a 24-hour day that there wasn't someone working in a Sprinkles bakery. So the phone could ring anytime, day or night. And then on top of that, I had these little boys who, you know, when they were little babies, they were portable. But now that they were starting to go to school and have commitments and that sort of thing, I didn't feel like I could be on the road as much. And so it was a personal decision as well as a professional decision. You know, it's, we, we've done what we can, we need to hand this off to somebody who is really has the operations expertise that we don't have. I mean, we can continue sure. to figure it out. We've done well so far. Um, nice. But there comes a time, I think. And and having come up in investment banking, there was this thing called founder syndrome, whereby the founder just has this like, you know, lock on the business and thinks that nobody else could understand <laughs> it or run it the way they can. And I didn't want to be that person. <laughs> yeah, it won't be me i swear <laughs> um that's amazing that it is interesting because there's like yeah a lot of founders who struggle with that part of it you this is not the business you started you're not doing the tasks you started doing a lot of founders and in like industry we're in for software like you're not writing code if you wanted to write code you're like managing people you're not you're thinking about cultural like org charts and like there's just a whole different thing at that scale that is not for everyone um which i always love when founders like recognize that and like yeah i actually don't enjoy this part of it and they like they sell or they get out and they bring in a ceo or whatever like because it's not what they wanted to be doing it's like great you find the next thing to that point though you did that and then there's so many questions, but what, what point does Pizana come into play here? What point do you decide to invest in other, like you have a portfolio of investments as well with CNT Ventures? Like, take me through those two things, where those fit into the, the story of Candace. <laughs> sure. So there are founders out there who, you know, sort of analyze an industry, see white space, and, and they kind of come up with a solution to a problem and they go for it. So much respect for that. That's not how I operate. <laughs> I am very focused on like passion being part of the plan. And so, you know, baking brought me to Sprinkles and my love for pizza mm. brought me to Pizzana. And it really came about almost accidentally. I met our now executive chef at a pizza party he was catering and I took one bite of his pizza. I went over to meet him. I heard his story and like the business was sort of building in my mind. I could see the brand. I could see the space. I could see exactly what I could do with it. And um, Daniele Uditi is his name, had come from Naples, Italy. And part of his American dream was to own his own restaurant. Ooh. And I just said, I would love to do that with you. Yes. <laughs> so we are, we are now, you know, opening our fifth location of Pizzana. We've also taken it out of state to Dallas. We're shipping um, nationwide, our frozen pizzas, but it, it really, it starts with a passion for me. And I think that there's sort of a, the connective thread between sprinkles and pizza is this idea of taking foods that people love, um, simple foods and elevating them right yeah. through ingredients, through technique, through experience. And, um, that's, that's just, I think how people love to eat. I know it's how I love to eat. And I also love the unifying power of food. And then from that too, investing in other businesses, like where does that fit in? Like you just like love the idea of supporting them. Like how do you, like how do you even decide to start doing that? Because there's a lot of ways to go about this. So CN2 Ventures is more of a venture studio. So Pizzana mm -hmm. is part of CN2 Ventures. Mm -hmm. And we have a couple other businesses, one um, in the early childhood space where we are pairing with founders and we are operationally involved. Now, mm -hmm. you know, depending on what ends up taking off that, ends up taking the lion's share of our time and work. And that right now is Pizzana. Um, and then on the side, I'm doing some angel investing just because I really, as I said, I love that 
early stage, you know, startup yes. phase. And I know that I can't keep starting all the businesses myself. So <laughs> that gives me a way to sort of keep playing in that, you know, early startup sandbox without having to get so distracted. Um, I love, you know, I love investing in products that I personally love, obviously, but also ones where I feel like I can add some meaningful value. So typically investing at very early stage and um, where I can add in terms of my, you know, social influence or my network or um, what have you. So um, that's just, that's just been a really fun way for me to continue to, um, you know, keep learning quite frankly, but also stay involved in that early stage piece. There's, there's one kind of like theme I want to talk about next. Like the last thing I want to jam about is brand. Obviously Sprinkles has a phenomenal brand. How do you think about building brands? Obviously you're investing in some, you're kind of seeding some thoughts around brand building. I know you've done, so, okay. I have a couple books, <laughs> another book recently, obviously on shows, not everyone wants to be that front facing, but you mentioned earlier in this interview, like you thought that was an important piece of it to, to do that. The brand strategy of you, like, how do you think about building brands? I'm just curious. On no, I'm glad you brought that up. And I feel like I was going to talk about that earlier, but then lost my train of thought. Lots but to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> my ADHD. Okay. Um, but when I was talking about how, you know, building a cupcake bakery is essentially not a defensible business. Yeah. Obviously I started with the product, but then beyond that, yeah. it really is about the brand. Absolutely. So leaned heavily into brand and, you know, trademarked whatever we could, which we ended up trademarking the modern dot, which is that, that decorative, um, edible, uh, decoration on top of the cupcake, because as soon as we opened and all these cupcake shops started popping up, guess what? They also looked a lot like ours <laughs> and there's yeah. not very much you can defend. So whatever you can do to sort of own that brand and keep showing up in a way that delivers on your brand promise. And, you know, your product is obviously what you're putting out into the world, but your brand is, is the feeling you give your customers, right? It's, it's how your brand lives in the hearts and minds of your customers. And, um, for sprinkles, it was all about injecting joy into everyday life. So everything we did was through that lens and with that in mind. And that is definitely a piece of the puzzle that helped us scale our business through the great recession. You know, people really still relied on sprinkles. It made them feel better. It was, it was a luxury, but an affordable luxury that they really relied, relied on during, you know, a downturn in the market. And so in the same way, we're really leaning into brand with beats on and hoping that that will help carry us through whatever recession, not recession that we're in or about to go through. With that brand side of things, I know you talked about earlier, like going into new markets completely like Dallas, for instance, you have an idea of what your brand is already, especially in the markets you're currently in and what you're built and developed. How does that translate in terms of going to a new market and like making sure you portray that brand both to obviously internally customers and everything, but then externally, like this is what we want people to think about this new brand coming in to a new location. Like how do you think about that when you've, as so you've expanded? brand in terms of, um, new customers or in terms of your team and the new, new, new customers. Yeah. So I think it does start with the team and what's really probably my favorite part about being at the helm of a growing business is being able to offer opportunity to people who want to grow with the business. So, um, you know, the, the idea that an assistant manager becomes a general manager, a general manager becomes, you know, a regional manager. And so, what we like to do is offer that opportunity to, you know, take someone from one uh, location and move them to another. So like our team mm -hmm. in Dallas is, is, has been trained by managers that came from our Brentwood location and they are really carrying that culture and um, those brand promises with them. And so it's just sort of naturally infused in our team. And those are our brand ambassadors, essentially, you know, they're on the front lines every day and, and they're delivering to our customers. But by the same token, I do believe it's important to, um, you know, be a neighborhood business to a certain extent. Like you want to be, you know, Sprinkles has to be Sprinkles, but it also has to be Sprinkles Dallas or Sprinkles Scottsdale. And so I think one of the things we've we've done well is in having those PR teams and those, you know, um, marketing teams on the ground locally, as well as, you know, 
just getting involved on a local level in terms of charities, um, food banks, um, local schools, that sort of thing. We want to have that neighborhood feel wherever we open, in addition to, you know, delivering on that on that overall brand promise as well. As we wrap things up here, Candace, tell us about the book, <laughs> the latest book. Tell us all the things. <laughs> sure. So I just released a book called Sweet Success. Um, it's about how to turn your passion into profit. And basically, it's a guide to entrepreneurship from conception to sale told through the lens of me as a first-time founder building Sprinkles. I was obviously bring in some other um, topics as well, feature some of my other female founder friends, as well as some things I've done since then. But the idea is that I really want to help more women at scale. I've done a little bit of mentoring and obviously some investing in female founded businesses, but being a founder is pretty much one of the hardest things you can do. (laughs) And, you know, I, I just, I wanted to offer that inspiration for people who are maybe scared to take that first step. Um, all the way through to, you know, scaling, building company culture that you love, that that attracts great hires, and um, building a brand from scratch because that's been so important to me. So really, Sweet Success is a book that no matter where you are in, in your sort of journey, you'll be able to take something from. Um, but ultimately, I wrote it to encourage more women to, to bet on themselves and live their dreams. I love it. Where's the best place for people to learn more about all the things you're doing, Candace, and connect with you as well? Sure. So I'm on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at Candace Nelson. And I'm also on LinkedIn. And then my book is available at local bookstores, also via Amazon. And I have a Substack, which is kind of <laughs> kind of regular, should be more regular than it is. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So there's many places to find you. We'll make sure we link everything in the show notes as well. Candice, this was so much fun. Thank you so much for the time today. Thank you so much.